Ladies, we'll start our next workshop in just a moment. I'd like to introduce our speaker to you. Our speaker for the second workshop is Erica Polston. Erica is a graduate of Central. She graduated in 1998. She has been employed at the Dollar General Warehouse in Fulton for the last 18 years. She loves the outdoors, and I asked her to be a speaker today because our theme is love stories. And Erica took us on a journey with her, um, well, several of us, through Facebook as her son battled cancer. And the theme, love stories, you, if you love somebody, you know you may experience loss. And she shared her journey with us in such a beautiful way on Facebook. And she came and spoke in chapel. And after chapel, I just asked if she would share her message with you today. And she agreed. Um, she's kind of like me. This is not her best favorite thing to speak in front of people, but she did a great job in chapel, and I just, um, if you would just say a silent prayer for Erica, that she will touch your hearts, because her message is so wonderful, and I think she's going to do great, so I'm going to turn it over to Erica. Hello. <laughs> um, you have to forgive me. I'm very nervous, as I usually am in front of people. Um, it's funny because I am a supervisor at my job, and I have to be in front of people every day. Um, but that feels different for some reason. Um, I see them every day. I know them. They're actually like family, so it doesn't bother me as much, um, I guess. But here I am, and... Um, Bear with me on my message. It might get scrambled. Um, hopefully, I keep it together and without tears. Um, but it's okay if you want to cry. <laughs> and it's okay if you don't. Um, but as Sherry mentioned, and as you know today, the, um, the topic is love stories. And I just wanted to talk about love for a minute. Don't you just love that word, love? I don't know what it is about that word, but it just makes me feel all good inside. <laughs> it's a, I like words, and for some reason that four-letter word just um, makes me happy. But what is that word, and what does it mean? Is it a noun? Um, the dictionary defines it as an intense feeling of deep inf affection. I almost said infection. Could be that too. <laughs> uh, um, such as, I really love this person. Or, it's a great interest in something, such as, I really love this game. Um, it could be a verb, uh, like a deep romantic feeling. Um, is it admiration? It could be so many things. But it could also be so much more than that. When we talk about somebody's love story, a lot of times we think about a romantic love or um, this person got married and that's their love story. But I believe there's different kinds of um, love stories. Everyone has different ideas of love and what those love stories should be. Um, so this person might think um, a love story is all about marriage, the church bells, the wedding dress, all that, and that's okay. Um, another person could think it's all about having the children, children that you always wanted. Um, another person could think it's their career and, and the success in that career. But the best ones that I've ever heard always start and end with Jesus. That's truly the best love story there is and there ever could be. So I'll tell you my story. Um, in order to tell you about my love story, I have to talk about a young boy named Gabriel. He is my five-year-old son. And for me, Gabriel means love. And I don't know, there he is. <laughs> um, that's, he was the definition of love for me in my life. Um, and to tell you about him, it's kind of a long story. Um, but I have to go way back to my youth. Um, I have to go back farther. So I have to start with my mother. And I don't have a picture of her. But my mother 
just to tell you about her, was one of the most beautiful people I've ever known in my life. Um, she was selfless and giving and caring and somebody that I want to be. <laughs> um, without her, my story wouldn't be as beautiful as it is. If you would ask me who my first hero in life was, it was my mother. If you would ask me who was my biggest inspiration in life, it was my mother. And my cheerleader, it was my mother. She was the epitome of kindness and love. She was a single mom with four children. Um, I have a younger brother and two older siblings. My dad passed away when I was very young. I did not know him. Um, so she was tasked to raise us alone and struggling to make ends meet, I'm, I'm sure of it. Although I never really knew that growing up, she was very good at hiding all that and letting us just be kids. So it was remarkable that um, I can tell you my childhood was great. Um, even though we didn't have much, uh, she made it great. We never had to worry about meals or roof over our heads. Um, she taught us that God was in control and that he would always provide. So she, I, I am a worrier. She was not, or maybe she was, and I just didn't know it. <laughs> um, but I would ever always question everything, and, um, but she would just say, God will provide, God will provide. He's, he's there for us. And you know what? She's right. Um, he always did. So, as I said, admittedly, I still am a worrier, but she had a way of calming and diffusing every fear that I would have, and her answer was always God. Um, as an adult, I often wonder how she managed that, because in my finite human mind, I, I'm terrified of, of everything, and I don't know how she did it, but um, the only explanation is that her faith in God. She had a full trust in him. Um, my mother taught me many things about life and how to live, and one thing she taught me above anything was the love of Jesus. She ensured that no matter what happened, we knew that Jesus was our rock, our salvation, and the one that loved us no matter what. It wasn't just in her words, but how she lived. And that is the most valuable lesson I could have ever gotten from her. She passed away in my early 20s from cancer. Um, I believe that she knew we were secure, her children were secure in Christ, and she could leave this world. Uh, she always said that she was ready to see Jesus, Jesus face to face when he called her home. Um, it was a very hard time. I'm not going to lie about that because she was my best friend. But because of her strength, I was able to uh, move on and, and go on with life. Um, but I'm always grateful for her teaching me what real love is, the solid, unwavering, unconditional kind of love, the love of a mother. And if any of you are mothers, which I'm sure many of you are, you know what that love is. You love your children more than you could even possibly love yourself. And that's how I loved Gabriel. Um, and, of course, I told you she taught us the love of Jesus. Because of my mother's abounding love and inspiration, I desired to be a mom. And that was my number one dream in life, just to be a mom. I wanted that more than anything I could ever think of from an early age. I always said I would have four kids. I have since said that's kind of ridiculous for me. But <laughs> my mother had four kids, so I thought, yeah, that, I could do that. No. <laughs> I had one, and um, that was wonderful. Um, so my true love story started a tad bit over seven years ago. Um, my doctor found a large mass on my uterus um, and sent me to a specialist. As it turns out, I had a two-pound tumor growing on my uterus. Where it came from, don't know. What it was, we don't know. Um, it wasn't cancerous, but it was blocking a lot of reproductive functions, and the chances of me having children were very slim. So the doctor set out to remove it. Um, but first he had to learn exactly what he was dealing with, and that caused him a difficult time. So it took him about six months to get to the point that we could do surgery. Um, many, many grueling doctor visits, trying to figure out what it was, what we would do. Um, and I remember him sitting down and telling me, you're never going to be able to have children. It was uh, very emotional for me because, of course, that was my number one dream. And I remember just crying and 
pleading to God, why, 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 why will I never have children? I want that so bad, more than anything. Um, and at some, some point along in the sessions, um, he told me that, well, it may be possible, but you're going to need my help. He was a fertility doctor, so he thought I would need to go for fertility treatments. Um, so he did um, the surgery. Uh, it was a myomectomy. He performed it in December of 2011. Uh, he said he had, he had to make a large inc incision to remove the tumor, and it was, it was about that big. It was pretty big. Um, when he was performing the surgery on me, he discovered that one of my fallopian tubes was severely damaged because of the tumor, so he had to remove that as well. So after the surgery, he sat down and told me, it may be possible. I don't want you to get your hopes up, but it may be possible for you to have children, but you only now have one fallopian tube, and you can only get pregnant every other month, and you're going to need to come see me <coughs> once I healed up from surgery. So, in April of the next year, four months after the surgery, I learned that I was pregnant. Gabriel was on his way. So, let me pause to tell you about his name. His name means God is my strength, and of course, you know, biblically, we know Gabriel was a messenger. Um, when my husband and I learned of Gabriel's existence, there was never a question of what his name would be. We did not discuss baby names. We did not discuss, um, should we name him this? We didn't even know whether it was a boy yet, but we didn't discuss anything. We just said Gabriel. I, I, I can't explain it other than that had to be God um, because the name fit him so well. Um, he was a miracle because he, theoretically, by doctor's um, diagnosis, he shouldn't have been possible. Um, now, all, children's are all children are miracles. I do believe that. Um, but we just couldn't believe that he was on his way so soon. So all I can ever tell people is it was God. So when we, he was born, we took him to meet the doctor that performed the surgery. The doctor came out to the lobby, and I'll show you what he did. <laughs> he looked at my charts, looked at me, looked at my charts, looked at Gabriel, looked at my charts, looked back at me, and he said, um, this is not possible. <laughs> and I said, oh, but with God, everything's possible. And I don't know if he was a faithful man or not, but I hope at some point he thinks about that and um, thinks that I said it was impossible, but I guess it wasn't. Um, somebody had other plans. Um, Gabriel was a joyful baby from a very early age. He loved the Lord. Um, I just keep looking at his picture. He's so sweet. <laughs> in fact, when he was still in the womb, the doctor commented on what a happy baby he was. How they know that, I don't know. He just said that he moves a lot and by his heartbeat. But when he was born, happiness was evident. So the doctor was right. He really was. And he loved life every single day. If you knew Gabriel you knew love. He loved with all that he was. I mean, with his entire being, he loved. He loved me very much, which most people comment on that bottom um, picture. So I guess it's to your right. Um, you can tell how much he loved me. He loved his dad. And most of all, he loved God. He, uh, he was five when he left this earth, but he... He was loved more than any adult I know. Um, Gabriel was a blessing on this earth for five glorious years, and his body got too tired of fighting. And he left, he left a little over a year ago. So losing Gabriel from this earth was shocking <laughs> and devastating. He was my dream. How could this happen? <laughs> How could this wonderful child that blessed this world be taken away and his life be but a mere flash? He was my love story. Why would God let him go? All these questions probably will never be answered on this earth, but what I can say is that we're never promised a life void of suffering. Um, and then I know beyond a doubt, God loves me. Uh, before I get into that chapter of my life, I'll elaborate a little bit more on Gabriel. Um, that chapter is my favorite. 
He was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, at two years old. Um, he spent exactly three years fighting for his life. He passed away three years to the date on diagnosis. He knew hospital life more than he knew home life. He lived in three different cities, three different states, um, other than his hometown. He knew more about medical procedures and terms, medical terms that any young child should know. But what was most remarkable about him, if you met him and you didn't know he had cancer, you wouldn't have known it. You would not have known that he was in the middle of the fight for his life because he was as joyful and happy as a healthy child. He lived every day to the fullest, never let anything stop him. And he had the most infectious smile, as you can see. Uh, he was full of one ingredient to life that we all strive to have and live for, and that's love. He only knew love. And I believe it went far beyond the love of me, his dad, or even his family. I believe that he knew a divine love better than I could have ever taught him. He was closer to God than even I was. He would shock me at times with what he would say. For instance... We'd be looking for a parking spot at the hospital, and I'd be very agitated <laughs> because I couldn't find one. Um, having a medically needy child, I, I wanted to find a really good spot for him, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where I could get him into the hospital safely and easily without getting crowds of, around crowds of people. Um, so I would look for the perfect parking spot when we would get there. And of course, in my humanness, get agitated because I couldn't find one. Now, I never did I say this necessarily to him, but my body language, I'm sure, <laughs> showed that. Um, but he would say, just out of the blue, out of the back seat, don't worry, Mommy, Jesus will get us a spot. And the first time he ever said that, I, I stopped the car and I looked back in the rearview mirror. I was like, he's three. He's three years old. He's telling me not to worry. And I just thought, that's just so profound for such a young age. But sure enough, we would find a spot, and he would say, see, I told you. Jesus got one for us. He loves us. Oh, be still my heart. He sure loved Jesus. And he knew that Jesus loved him. If you knew Gabriel, you were instantly his friend. He called everyone he met his friend, and I mean everyone. Whether you were two or 92, you were his friend, and he wouldn't let it go. That's my friend. He had a lot of friends. He had the amazing ability to bring people together, even within the confines of a hospital, even in strange cities where we knew no one, and it was just me and him against the world. He was truly a gift to this world. He loved people. He loved to help people. He always gave his nurses and doctors gifts with the expense of mom's pocketbook. <laughs> when he, he did, he loved to give um, the nurses chocolate because he thought they love chocolate. So at some point, he, we must have given them some chocolate and they um, liked it. And he was like, ooh, they love this. So we always bought the expensive Dove chocolate. <laughs> and uh, they did. They loved it. And... Um, they knew this is from Gabriel. And he liked to make them crafts and things, too. He would always do that stuff. When we saw somebody in need, he'd asked, um, he asked me to help them. Um, I can remember being on the streets of Philadelphia. That was one of the cities we lived in. And there was somebody needing food. And he said, Mommy, we need to feed that person. Okay, we will do that. Um, he'd often ask me to buy toys and things for other kids in the hospital. When he'd hear somebody crying, it was very sweet of a child crying, he would say, Mommy, that kid needs their mommy. And he would say, what can we do for him? Um, he would always thank the housekeeping staff for cleaning his room. Um, he was just a very giving, gracious child. For his last birthday, he asked me to buy toys for all the kids coming to his party. And he watched them open their gifts before he opened his. When he was in his very last days, he gave me a list of toys to give to other children that were his um, and asked me not to forget. He said, they need that. Mind you, he didn't know he was going to pass away. So his excuse was that he was just too big for them anymore and he was a big kid now. 
He had a heart of gold, and he loved everyone. So at some point during his journey, um, he came up with a motto with me, um, and it's, he called it Live Like Crazy Today. So what that meant was, and if you've ever seen my Facebook page, you'll see that a lot, <laughs> Live Like Crazy Today. What it meant was to never miss a moment. Um, don't let the troubles of life get you down because they're going to come, and you're going to have a lot of troubles. And it's going to be different for everybody. Um, we have no idea who's going to have what troubles. Um, but if you let them get, get you down, you'll miss out on the most wonderful parts that God's given us. So it could be enjoying nature, which he did, or spontaneously rolling down a hill. So at one point, when we were in Bethesda, Maryland, which was another city we lived in for treatment, um, we were walking back to the apartment building that we had, and uh, there's this hill on the side of a busy road um, on, off the sidewalk, and there was rocks and all kinds of stuff down that hill, bugs, of course. It's the middle of summer. And he looks, and he says, Mommy, can I... And he had a pick line in his arm, so very... Um, easily could damage that and cause a lot of suffering, <laughs> a lot of bleeding, a lot of going to the hospital. So, but he looked at me and said, Mommy, can we roll down that hill? And of course, the mother in me was like, no, that's a bad idea. You got a pick line, there's rocks, there's bugs, there's all kinds of stuff. And I looked at his little sweet face, and I, I knew that we may never know how long he's going to live. So I said, sure. And man, you've never seen a happier kid in your life. <laughs> he just rolled down that hill, and it taught me something. It taught me that sometimes we just got to let go, and we just got to say yes to those things and, and live. And when it also taught me that when God says, do this, we got to do that. Um, so living like crazy could be visiting somebody or visiting a place, and it's always laughter and lots of it. If anyone lived, anyone that I ever knew that lived, it was Gabriel. He didn't let a day pass without love or laughter and didn't miss a moment. He sure loved life. I will never understand why he had to leave this earth so quickly, but the one thing I do know is that he left his mark more than I could have ever imagined. And the other thing I've learned is that life is not about me. Life is not about Gabriel. Life is about Jesus and glorifying Jesus. Um, people, people stop me and tell me that they don't, they don't know me. I've had this happen to me, um, whether I'm in Walmart or whatever. They don't know me, but they knew Gabriel, and they knew him because of Facebook. And he was an inspiration to them. I've had many people message me and tell me that they prayed for the first time in their life because of him. I've had people tell me that because of him, they came back to the Lord. And that, to me, is so valuable. So through all my pain and suffering, those things bring me joy. You know, Jesus understands that kind of pain. He, uh, we read about it when we read about Lazarus. He felt that human emotion, that pain, that suffering, that Lazarus was gone. So he understands. So if we ever once, for once think that he doesn't understand, he does. He understands the deepest level of everything that we'll ever go through. Um. But what I wanted to say about Gabriel most of all is he taught me about love and about the love of God and trusting God. You see, that's how much God loves us. Amidst our suffering, we get blessings from it. I truly believe that God did not want Gabriel to leave this earth and for me to lose my precious love. But those things happen because this is a broken world and we can't control what the world does. But what we can do is rely on God. God uses our pain and all our broken pieces, and He sweeps them up, and He uses it for His glory if we allow Him to. We have, we have to give ourselves to Him for Him to be able to do that, and then He'll show us the glories that come from our suffering. 
Suffering is an opportunity for good, an opportunity for God to be seen. But it's up to us to make that choice. When things happen to us, when these bad things in life, lose a child, lose somebody in your family, whatever it may be, do we cling to him and allow him to make something beautiful? Or do we become bitter? It's very easy to become bitter. I've been to the depths after losing my only son. I've been to the depths of feeling bitterness towards the world. But I can't allow myself to go there. I have to know that God's going to make something beautiful out of it. Something good is going to happen. Um, I always do ask, how can we know true joy if we're never broken? And I have felt that. I have clung to God more in this past little over year um, because I've been so broken. Because the one thing that I've always wanted is gone. He, (laughs) he's in a much better place, a place I want to go. He's with the Father. And that picture, well, that's him. But that picture of Jesus and that little boy, that's not him as a little boy, but everybody thought it was. (laughs) So I found, actually, the the day he passed away, I found that picture online. And um, everybody thought, how did you do that? Like, no, I just found that picture. Just looks like him. Um, But I love that picture because that shows Gabriel's love and his love for Jesus. He sure did. So something I want to talk about is how to live through grief because... I'm still learning, (laughs) and I think I will be learning all my life. Losing my mother was very, very hard and devastating for me. But losing Gabriel was even worse, and probably the worst thing I've ever experienced in my life. Um, I'm not an expert on how to live through grief (laughs) at all, but I thought maybe I could share just a little bit of how I deal with it, and it may help somebody. I don't know if any of you have grief in your life. It may help you, but you probably know somebody that does. Um, One thing we need to remember is that God does love us so much, and he is truly the greatest love story of our lives. No matter what we do, no matter where we are, no matter who we are, he loves us, even when we're feeling broken and in despair. Actually, that's when God shows up the most, because that's when we need him the most. Psalm 34, 18 states that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. He is near. He feels that pain, and he's holding us, even though we can't feel that, he is. I have to tell myself that many times when I get into feeling really sad or in despair. I have to remind myself that God loves me. He knows my pain. He knows every hair on my head. He knows every hair on your head. He gave up his only son for us, so he knows the ultimate pain, and it gives us hope. John 6, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. And in Isaiah 41, 10, he says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Wow, what a comfort. He knows that we'll struggle. He knows that we'll have trials. He knows that we'll be broken. But he's overcome the world to give us peace, real peace, true peace. He gives us peace for the present and courage for the future. He says that this world will try to have power over us and we'll have those devastating times. I, I could feel the struggle when, when Gabriel passed. This world was trying to take me. But God has the last word. We read in Romans 8.31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that. Who can be against us if God is on our side? He never leaves us. He loves us so much that he sees when we fall, he sees when we're hurting, and he swoops in like the father that he is and rescues us with the promise that we'll go with him soon. That keeps me going. 
I know that I'll see Jesus face to face and I'll get to see my Gabriel again. Romans 8.28 says that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. He can take those broken things and make them beautiful. In Matthew 11.28, Jesus says, Come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. And I think that we will get that rest when we finally see him, like my Gabriel has. We just need to go to him, and he will reveal his love to us, a love more powerful than any earthly love we will ever know. As hard as it is for me to imagine, it's a love more powerful than the love I have for Gabriel. That's a lot of love. And the love that he had for me. We have something far better coming. This earth can only provide so much, but the promise of Jesus is so much more. So when sufferings come and love seems lost, Remember um, that in Romans 8, 18, 8, 18, the sufferings of the present time are not worthy, not worthy to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. I cling to that verse. The sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we receive. I think about the day that I'll go to heaven and all this suffering just be washed away. And won't even remember it. It won't even, this broken, beat up heart will be whole again. So, one thing I want to talk about real quick is how can you comfort ones that are grieving? I don't have all the answers to that. I still don't know. And if people would ask me, how can I help you? I don't know. But one thing I do know is that the best comfort to me is the people that have just been there. Just be there. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Just be there. That is powerful. Um, don't say things like, well, he's in a better place, because we all know that. Truly, he is in a better place. I don't need to be told that. Um, God must have needed him. Pretty sure that I needed him more. <laughs> and not saying anything against God, but... Um, God, God may, may have needed him, but I don't, that phrase just hits a wrong chord. You just know that you're going to have moments of up and down. There will be moments where I can be really, really happy and uh, something good can be going for a day or whatever. And then that evening, I get home, and it's an empty house, and my son's not there, and everything just goes crashing down, um, bottoms out. So there's extreme highs and extreme lows. Um, it's important to know that, and you can never know those moments. I could be walking um, or driving somewhere or whatever, and everything be fine, and then I see something, and a memory comes back, and I just lose it. So the best thing you can do for those ones grieving is just care about them. Check on them. Just be there for them. Um, ask them how they're doing. Ask them if they need to talk, and just let them talk. No matter what they say, just let them talk. You're not going to have advice. You're not going to have the best words of wisdom. I don't even have that to fellow friends that have lost children. Um, unfortunately, I do have a lot of friends that I made during this journey that have lost children. I don't have the right words to say to them because it's not fair. But um, what I can say to them is that Jesus loves them. Jesus loves their child and always will. And the best thing, the very best thing that you can do is live like crazy today. Don't miss a moment. Remember Gabriel and his words and do the best you can to get the most out of life because we truly, truly do not know when our last moment is. If you would have asked me a week before Gabriel passed away, do you think he's going to pass away? I would have said no. Um, I would have been hesitant, more hesitant than anybody else because I knew my son. But the doctors um, even told me the night, the night before he passed away, he's not going to pass away, the evening before. He passed away at 5 o'clock in the morning. But that, that very evening, they were like, get some rest, Erica. He's not going. 
His vital signs are great. Everything is good. And I finally fell asleep, which only could be what that the Lord put sleep in me because I didn't sleep for days while we were in that hospital. Um, and he went to sleep peacefully. And everybody was shocked. The doctor came in crying and said, I'm so sorry. I didn't know this was going to happen. We don't know when the Lord decides things are going to happen. So that's why we have to live our lives to the fullest, live like crazy, and be there for those that need us. And always know that the Lord loves us no matter what, and we need to put our trust in him. Thank you.